case, we'll, we'll get started. Um, so th this is a session on uh, session C3 on kind of computational simulation on geotechnical and structural systems. I'm Greg Deerling. I'll be moderating the session and along with the students keeping everybody to time. Uh, so anyway, I'd like to get right into it. We, we'll start off with a dynamic duo of uh, two geotechnical sessions to start. We, uh, we're going to have these in Argentinian Spanish. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'd like to wake, welcome up uh, Pedro Adrino, who will give us the first talk today. Pedro from the University of Washington. Postdoc with the Sim Center. Yeah. So uh, th thank you very much. My, again, my name is Pedro Arduino from the University of Washington. First, to acknowledge my student, Long Chen, who did a lot of the work that I will present here today. Um, timer first, go. So I have a very simple presentation here of a topic that is uh, very well known, but still continue to be uh, the bread and butter of a lot of what we do in geotechnical engineering, in particular uh, in practice. And that's the problem of uh, free field analysis. So usually what we have is a soil domain where we have an elastic half phase, we have a soil that is very nonlinear, and we want to put a structure uh, on top of the soil, and of course we want to do the dynamic analysis. We want this motion in order to do the analysis. In general, this motion is not known, so we do some prediction analysis. This other motion, which is the rock outcrop motion, is easier to get. Uh, actually, what we try to do is to model the nonlinearity of the soil using a column. Uh, we try to propagate the wave from the bottom uh, to the surface. And it's important to know that this motion at the bottom is also not the same as the rock outcrop. It's not the same. So we have a kind of a complicated uh, problem uh, to deal with. And this is what I want to try to analyze. When we do the numerical analysis of this, first of all, we have to define the layering. The layering defines the stiffness, the nonlinear properties of the soil. And from there, we try to develop a model. Usually, the model is a one-dimensional model. This is one of the first things that we do. I call this 1D, wave propagation, one computation. Usually, here, we use a constitutive model that is in the one, uh, in one dimensions. The other alternative is to go to 2D. Here, in order to model the 1D wave propagation, we have to tie the nodes. And uh, now we can use a constitutive model that maybe is implemented in a two-dimensional world. And the last alternative is to, again, do the 1D wave propagation, but now using three components. And for this, we have to use a 3D finite element. And here, we have to implement a three-dimensional constitutive model, even though that we are trying to model a 1D wave propagation uh, problem. So the ingredients that we need here in order to do this analysis, I want to mention these things so that uh, that's the uh, line of thought that I follow when I try to do these, uh, these things. First, we need to have a good computational framework. We can use equivalent linear analysis. We have been using this for more than 50 years. We can use finite elements. We can use uh, finite differences. Flag, open seas are examples of that. We can do total stress or effective stress. If we want to include per water pressures, we have to do an effective stress analysis. So it's important that when you have, uh, when you use your finite elements, you use an, appro an, an, uh, an appropriate formulation. If you want to do a couple formula um, effective stress analysis, you have to use a couple formulation. UP is the most common of that. Very important, the robustness of this finite element, but that's not that difficult because they are very well established. And also the efficiency of the finite element. Here we can play a little bit more. We can use a one-point integration method that would simplify things a lot in the 3D, but for that you have uh, to have a special implementation. We have one of those in OpenSys is called the um, stabilized single point uh, UP brick element. After that, the bottleneck is constitutive model. Here again, formulation and implementations are very important if you, try, if you want to do something uh, that is good uh, at this level. And I will mention something else a little bit later. And of course, boundary conditions how to model the rock uh, compliance, how to model absorbing boundaries. This is not a simple problem, even for a one dimensional case. And of course, you need to have a pre and post processor, and you need to have some functionality to run these things in, uh, in parallel. So let's touch base a little bit on the bottleneck that is the constitutive model. So here, again, important the formulation. When you are doing cyclic analysis, and what you want to do in a free field analysis is to consider a cyclic response, here it's very important to uh, include the nonlinearity, not only during loading, but also during unloading. 
And for that, the only way to do that using conventional plasticity theories is using kinematic hardening. And for this, the two theories that are very commonly used in practice, one is based on what is called nested surfaces, and the work by Prevost and El Gamal is very well known. And there are some models that follow this in some applications like OpenSys. The other one is to use bounding surface. And here we can look at the work that the Falias started like also 35 years ago. Borja and Amis had some very nice implementations in the 94. And then applications to liquefiable soils by Mansari da Falias. And more recently, there is a model that I will mention a little bit more that is called the pm 4 sun So one thing is the formulation and connected to that is the implementation. So implementation and formulations go hand to hand. Some formulations are suited for certain implementations, some others are not, don't try. So we have implicit, explicit implementations and we have implicit uh, implementations. In some of these implementations, it's important to mention the consistent tangent operator that ensures to obtain quadratic conversions and get some efficiencies at the simulation level. So I want to mention something about one of those models and that model uh, is uh, pm 4 san why do I want to mention that? Because one year ago, this day, in this meeting, it was presented by Ross Boulanger. So this is a model developed by Ross Boulanger and Katerina Siotopoulou in 2015. And it follows the framework of Mansari de Fales. It's a bounding surface model that has been modified so that it captures well the response that is observed in the lab and also in the field. So following the same uh, formulation from Mansari, that proposed by Mansari and Afalias that uses bounding surface and critical state concepts, they did uh, an update so that the response that is obtained with the model represents what is observed in the lab and also in the field for cyclic loads. Uh, and the soil under and drain conditions. So don't try to push much away from that, uh, those uh, boundaries, because that's what the model is, uh, is for. Most important, it has three uh, primary parameters that are easy to obtain uh, in the field. One is the relative density. The other one is the shear modulus or shear wave velocity. The last one is a construction parameter that you have to calibrate, uh, calibrate for. Now, the model has many other parameters, like 21, that has been calibrated so that you obtain a good response, but also can be calibrated by you if you try to model a specific response that you obtain for a particular sun uh, in, in, in your lab. So the model has been implemented in OpenSeas and in other, to, in other frameworks too. Originally, it was done in FLAC. So, well, this was just a, an image of how is the model. I will bypass this and I will go directly here. Before I do anything in a constitutive, uh, or before I use any constitutive model, the first thing that I do is to look, okay, this is my finite element. I will look at a point. For that point, I will try to define a little square. And in that square is where I will start testing my constitutive model. It's like checking your engine for a car outside the car to see if it works, because here I can apply stress load histories or strain load histories and really push the uh, constitutive model to see uh, if, uh, if it works. So let's go there. How do I do this? Well, I develop a, a, a system that's called the mixed driver where I can test the, the, the constitutive model. These are responses for uh, the, the undrained response for soils uh, for different relative densities. And here I am comparing with the flak response. Ross and Katerina already did all the validation to tell me that this response represents Toyota Sun. What I am trying to do is to see if my model that I created uh, uh, captures what they observe. This is for a monotonic load, for a cyclic load more interesting. First thing to notice, I don't get exactly the same. Why? Because I am not using their code. They have an implementation in FLAC. I have something completely uh, different. This is for one relative, relative density. This is for another relative density. Different response, you see the uh, cycling mobility and the stress strain response that is common in liquefiable soils when they are subjected to these loads. Then you start pushing a little bit more the effect of overburden. 
different overburdens here with different colors. And what you look is the, cycli the number of cycles to reach a certain level of deformation for different densities. And you see that what is obtained in a flag compared to what I obtained is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. Second, why instead of overburden uh, um, effect, why don't we look at the effect of shear stresses? This is what is called the K-sigma effect. And again, compare the, uh, the results uh, from a flag and uh, the mixed driver. Once I have this, and I am confident that I am getting good results, and you see some differences, you will observe this always. I put this in a finite element, and I test one little element. At one element, it's difficult to do things because now you have to apply boundary conditions. It's not easy to apply the low D condition when you have to now push the element itself. But the response from uh, plugs, uh, from uh, open seas and uh, flag, they have to be the same. So this is the next level in the validation process that I follow. After that is where I can say, okay, I have a model that seems to replicate what it was for. Now I will go to the analysis of uh, a, free, a free field analysis. For that, what we did is to do a validation study where we consider <laughs> different densities. That means layers that are liquefiable with different uh, N160s, if you want. We also consider different thicknesses. We also consider different motions. And what we did is to say, well, how do I know that I am getting something that is valid? Why don't I compare my results that I obtained with OpenSys with results that are obtained from FLAG and also from Plaxis? Plaxis was also doing a similar effort in order to implement the same model in, in there. So with that is where we started to do first an elastic analysis, but then we did uh, some analysis considering strong motions. What I am showing here first is this is the motion that I use, one of those motions. Here is what you have is the response at the surface. This is an, a, a scale up of the motion that you have up here, areas intensity and the response spectrum. And what you have here is that the comparisons between open seas, flag, and plaxis, all done by different people. What you have is profiles of peak horizontal acceleration, maximum shear strain, maximum displacements, cyclic stress ratios, and of course, maximum pore water pressure ratios. This is for one motion, this is for another motion, this is for another motion. So I start getting some confidence in, uh, in this. After that, I say, well, I can do free field analysis. What if I add a little bit of shear stresses, inclining a little bit the column? I can do is modeling a, a semi -infin in, uh, an infinite slope. I can do that just changing the gravitational field. And again, I do comparisons with one motion. This is the Gilroy motion. This is a Northridge motion. This is a, a Chichi motion. What you observe here is that we are pushing the model much more. The maximum uh, relative displacement, now we are talking about one meter of displacement. We are pushing the element uh, much more. I start having some confidence now in that all the implementations are doing more or less the same, and the model has been already validated by Ross and Katerina so that it represents what happens in the field. So now I can start doing some other things. Like, for example, I can consider that I have an homogeneous uh, liquefiable layer. What if I randomize the properties here. So what you have here in black are the response for the homogeneous layer. What if I randomize the properties here, like relative density, so that I capture some spatial variability? And now we can start doing some analysis here and see what's the effect of having a random field in the response, not only in the profiles along the depth, but also in the maximum displacement that you obtain at the surface. These are things that now I have some confidence. That's one route that I can go. The other route that I should go is to do some verification. So here I have results for the case of Port Island, 1995 cover earthquake. I am only modeling 32, um, um, 32 meters of the, of the soil profile. I had response at that level, and then we also had recordings from the field at 16 meters and also close to the surface. So using the response at 32 meters, I try to model what happens along the layer using the PM4 Sun model. And in this case, I also use PM4 Silt, which is a new model that now works for Silt. And this is the response that you obtain at the surface, comparisons with what it was recorded, time history and response spectrum. And here is what was recorded at 16 meters. And again, is the, uh, the recorded and the simulated values. This is for uh, Port Island. This is for wildlife, another one 
that uh, for the 1987 Superstition Hills uh, earthquake. Much, much shallower uh, soil profile, only 7.5 meters. We had the information at the bottom. We have the information for the soil. We can represent that with a soil column using the PM4 sand model. Here we also use uh, uh, the pressure independent multi yield. And again, comparisons between what was recorded at the surface, time history, and the response spectrum here. I have even more confidence now that things are working. What we have done is, for the help of you, is try to put this into Jupyter Notebooks so that people that is interested, now you can go and try to uh, replicate what we have done or maybe model your own uh, cases. If you go to the Design Safe uh, website and you go to Community and look at uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, you will find these Jupyter Notebooks that allow you to first run OpenSeas. Second, run a free field analysis. Third, pro post -pro process all the results using some Python uh, scripts. We, have all, we are also developing an app with the Sim Center now, not with Design Safe. This is what we call the Site Response app that will include uh, the, um, the possibility to run a free field analysis considering the PM4 sound <coughs> mode. I have only one, I want to include one more minute in, in my analysis to say what is next. So what we are trying to do now is to connect this with a regional analysis to start doing free field analysis uh, at different points in a, in a location. For that, we need the motions at the rock. For that, we can use the broadband platform. But broad, the broadband platform was created by uh, SCAC. And what we have been doing is to say, well, do, why don't we add a free field analysis module here? So the broadband only requires a source information for the location where is the rupture plane. You also need the location points where you want the time histories. It's only for certain sites in Southern California, Northern California, and also in, uh, in Japan. And from there, that's the input that we put here and we want the output. For this particular case, we are only interested in the nonlinearity due to the degradation of the shear modulus. So we have implemented a model that is called the, a the Borja and Amis model that is also available in OpenSeas, implemented by the group at UW and also here at Berkeley, not here, uh, in Berkeley by, uh, by Nick Sitter several years ago. So what we have done is to develop a bash file that what it does is to run the broadband, uh, broadband uh, tool, then manipulates the motions, creates input files for OpenSeas, runs OpenSeas, and then post-process the results. We presented that to SCEC and they say, no, we don't like that. What we want is to have a new broadband tool that has the option to run a FEM analysis inside the BBP. So that's what we have done. We have included a functionality that is finite elements and uh, 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 um, an initial version is available in GitHub for anybody that would like to use. It's called BBP UDA. With that, that gives you an idea of what I've been trying to do for doing nonlinear site response analysis and where we are trying to go in the future. Thank you very much, and sorry I extended one minute.